Let me do something first. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the American chestnut tree. Uh, it used to be one of the most important natural resources in the eastern United States. And it's hard to find anybody less than about 60 years old who even knew there ever was such a thing as an American chestnut tree. So we'll spend some time talking about how important this tree was to the history and economic development and the cultures of the eastern United States up until about the uh, middle of the 1900s. And then we'll talk about how we almost lost this magnificent resource. That's the bad news. And then we'll get into the good news about the American Chestnut Foundation and how we, we hope we're on the verge of bringing this tree back to our forest, which would be an amazing accomplishment if we can do it. Uh, a lot of people ask me, how I got interested in the American chestnut tree. It all started when I was about five years old. And uh, some of you may have a similar story. Uh, my father took me to a hill in Harvard, Massachusetts, Bear Hill, you folks in the back recognize that. And he showed me this huge, magnificent tree. And he told me that was the last living American chestnut tree that he was aware of. And he knew his trees, he was a builder, he used lumber and whatever. It didn't mean much to me when I was five years old, but I always had an interest in natural resources and the outdoors, so I pursued a career in wildlife science. And I kept coming across these references to how important this tree had been. And then about 10 years ago, I found out there was an organization, the American Chestnut Tree, that was trying to bring this tree back. So I had to get involved. So that's sort of some background. And let's first of all clear up the fact that we are not talking about the horse chestnut tree. Horse chestnut tree is an ornamental. It has that large flower structure that you see in the, in the springtime, about so big, it's very colorful. The horse chestnut tree was introduced to the United States a long time ago, in fact, uh, you history buffs, if you go to the, the Wilcox Lad House over in Portsmouth, there's a, there's a horse chestnut tree growing there that was planted when the Declaration of Independence was signed. So that's how long ago the horse chestnut was introduced to the United States. Fortunately, this tree does not survive in our forests. The only time you'll see them is out in an open area in a park along a roadside. So that's the end of the discussion on the horse chestnut. What we do want to talk about is the American chestnut tree. This is the one that was native to the eastern United States. It's, it's not even closely related to the horse chestnut tree. They, well, let me back up a second. You're probably familiar with the horse chestnut. It has this <coughs> compound. That's one leaf with five leaflets on it. There does have a nut. There's one nut in each burr. And as we said, the flower structure looks like that. Well, the American chestnut tree is totally different. They're related to beech trees. You might recognize the leaf is similar to a beech. And when they flower, these little green things here, about the big as the tip of your, your little finger, those are the flowers. So that you, you don't even, you hardly see them when they're, they're actually flowering. And it's a magnif it grew magnificently tree, a huge tree. There, there was not uncommon for six foot diameter American chestnuts to be growing right here in Nashua. Not uncommon at all. When they do flower, as I said, you can hardly see the flowers in there. Then these are the catkins that produce the pollen. And each of those little flowers does develop into about a tennis ball sized burr. And in each burr, there's, there could be up to three nuts in each burr. So that's the difference between the horse chestnut and the American chestnut. The historic range extended all the way from Maine right down through the Appalachian Mountains to northern Florida, southern Georgia, and west out to the Mississippi River. As this, this is the remnants of an American chestnut tree 
that we found up in the White Mountains National Forest, just uh, around Sandwich. It's a little hard to see, but these two men, are, this, is just, this is the arc of the tree right here. So that tree would have easily been six feet in diameter. And that was here in New Hampshire. Back in, and this is, uh, they're very res resistant to rotting. So if you do find an old one like that, they'll stay around for years. They have some very unique qualities to them. Uh, there was almost nothing wrong with this tree. It seemed to do everything right. Uh, you've heard the term shade tolerant and shade intolerant. Some plants and trees will not survive in shade and others won't survive in direct sunlight. The American chestnut tree is both. This is a tree, in fact, this cookie as we call it, I have it with me right here. You can come up and look at it later. Right in there in the center, about the inner two inches, there are 25 growth rings because it was shaded by the forest canopy. They love sunlight, but they'll survive without sunlight. So this tree just sort of sat there for 25 years waiting for something to happen to open up the canopy. And when it did, in the next 15 years, it put on that much growth, an inch of growth a year when they really get going. That's just one unique feature of this tree. And as we go along, I'll point out a few more. Let's talk about the historic and the cultural value of this particular tree. It was resistant to rotting. It was relatively lightweight, the wood, the lumber, extremely strong. It would not warp, or very seldom would it warp or slip or split if you cut the boards. It just had everything going for it. And it was a food source. The nuts from the American chestnut were quite edible. When Johnny Mathis sings that song every year, this is what he's singing about, the American chestnut tree. Anybody want to sing along here? <laughs> Native Americans certainly knew the value of this tree. They used it for, for many, many purposes, probably more than we did when we came along. Then when the white settlers came along, of course, back in the, in the early days, you used whatever resources you had available. And this is one of the most important resources that was used for, for building timbers and floors and just about anything. I'd really be surprised to find out that there is not American chestnut wood somewhere in this building. The most likely is. The woodwork in the New Hampshire State House is made out of American chestnut. But it's all been painted, so you can't see it. But it's <laughs> uh, if you drive along the, the Blue Ridge Parkway down in North Carolina, you'll see miles and miles of these uh, split rail fences. They're almost all made out of American chestnut, and they've been there for 100 years. This utility pole is still standing, still being used down in Harwich, in Cape Cod. Was put up in 1928, no preservatives on it. It's still there, it's still being used. In fact, this gentleman, he's one of the Massachusetts chapter members and he works with the power company. He's the one who figured out that that was a, an American chestnut tree. I mentioned that it was resistant to rotting that's due to a compound called tannin that's in some trees that it, it reduces their, 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 uh, uh, their, improves their resistance to rotting. But also tannin was used to make leather. The wood would be chipped up, boiled, that would extract the tannin from the chipped up wood, and then hides would be exposed to the tannin and the tannin would, would draw, somehow draw the water out of the tides, and that was the first step in making leather. This mill in Compton, North Carolina, in 1920s, it used over 100,000 cords of chestnut a year just for extracting tannin. That's how abundant and important it was. I'm sure there are people here who remember your grammar school teacher had a big green ink blotter on her desk. Now I see a few heads nodding. Well, what somebody figured out that after they extracted the tannin for making leather, it made a very uh, cheap, but very absorbent paper. They could use the pulp to do that. And that's where most, if not all, of those old green ink blotters came from. 
furniture, it was certainly used for furniture because it was so readily available and workable and durable. How many of you have been up to the Robert Frost farm in Derry? Only a couple of you? Aren't you history people? <laughs> yeah, if you go up to the Robert Frost farm, take the little tour, go upstairs in the, uh, in the bedroom and you'll see this solid American chestnut bed. Uh, there was a company down in Pawtucket, Rhode Island that uh, made these uh, machinist tool chests, they were called. They were small tool chests. And I found quite a few of these wandering around New England and New York in antique shops. And every one I found was made out of American chestnut. The U.S. Forest Service keeps a record of how different states use various species of wood on an annual basis. I found this report from 1912 and, and how New Hampshire used different woods. And this is what it, it said about American chestnut. It was used for, for fences and a lot of railroads. If you go around some of the old railroads, the old railroad ties you'll see along the old tracks, they're probably American chestnut. It was used for some of the old uh, ice chests were made of chestnut. Uh, and Hames. Anybody? What are hames? Nobody knows. Okay. You seen a draft horse? Puts a big collar on him. Puts these things out in front of the column. The, those are hames. Well, the reason this showed up in New Hampshire as being an important use of chestnut was that there used to be a small mill up in Sunapee that made hames. And they used chestnut to do it. And that's a really good Scrabble word, by the way. So. <laughs> okay. And I mentioned that it was a food source, a very unique feature of any tree that have a food source. And this was what used to happen back in the old days. The wagon loads of chestnuts would be, when they would, would, they would be harvested in the fall, they'd be taken in wagons into cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia, uh, gentlemen told me once when he, he was in his 90s, he remembers chestnuts roasting on the streets of Boston. So, and also, it was a very, very important wildlife food. We don't know how important American chestnut was to our wildlife populations because by the time wildlife habitats and wildlife management really started to be studied was in the, in the mid 1930s. And by then, the chestnut tree was pretty much gone from our forest. So we don't know how important it was as a food source. We do know, though, that it certainly was important. Uh, Rita Blythe, a graduate student at the University of Indiana, did this very simple study. She just took all different kinds of mass crops, acorns, beech nuts, chestnuts, walnuts, whatever, and just put them in these, these poles, and she'd go back and check on them every day. And what she found was the very first thing to go before anything else were the American chestnuts. So the wildlife was most interested in those. And for what it's worth, the last thing to go was the black walnuts. <laughs> by, the, by the way, if you want to see a big, beautiful black walnut tree, just look out the back door here. That is one gorgeous walnut tree. But you better be careful about standing under it this time of year. <laughs> And that's a coming there. <laughs> well, all these benefits are gone. All these things I just talked about were just common knowledge back in the late 1800s up till the mid 1900s. And today, you don't hear anything about any of these benefits. Well, what went wrong? We have a habit of importing all kinds of things from all over the world. I mentioned that, ho that horse chestnut over in, uh, in Portsmouth. Well, we started introducing, there are several different species of chestnut around the world. The, the only one in the United States is Castanea dentata with the American chestnut. But there's a European species, there's a two Asian species. Well, at somewhere time along the road, Somebody imported some Asian chestnuts. And with those trees came a disease, a, a pathogen known as chestnut blight 
Cryphonectra parasitica, and it is an airborne fungus. It's like, you know, take a puff ball, you know, and you see all that, every little element in that puff is a spore that could produce another mushroom. Well, the same thing happens with this chestnut blight. Those spores are distributed and all they have to do is get in a little crack in the bark, just one spore, and the, the blight grows around the circumference of the tree and girdles it, shuts off the flow of the saps up and down the tree. So, but now here's something you have to remember because it's going to be on the test. <laughs> the, when the blight hits a tree, affects a tree, it does not kill the, anything below where the infection occurs. It only kills what's up above it. So the roots aren't affected by the blight. So remember that. It's, it'll, it'll come up again. So, okay. It first showed up in 1904 in the New York Botanical Gardens. It took them a few years to figure out what was going on. But they finally did realize that it was this, this pathogen, this airborne pathogen. And you can see how fast it spread. By the 1920s, it was up into all of Massachusetts and right here in southern New Hampshire. And by the 1950s, it had consumed the whole 200 million acre range of the chestnut tree. And it killed almost every one of them. It was just deadly. You can imagine such an important resource. Everybody was trying everything they could to stop the blight. Remove diseased trees, fungicides, anything they could come up with. There was some crossbreeding done just between the Chinese tree and the American tree, but those trees were just as susceptible as the wild American chestnuts, so that didn't work. So you might say, well, if the Asian tree can resist the blight, just let them take over and we'll be okay. Well, there's two problems with that. One is, this is a mature Chinese chestnut tree. They do produce nuts, but they don't get very big and they get bushy. And they're like the horse chestnut. Fortunately, they will not survive in a forest environment. So if you see one of these, they're only going to be in a landscape situation. There's one down at Riviera College growing in the yard. They're, they're not hard to find. They're, uh, there are a lot of people have planted them. Anybody live out in uh, Lineborough? Okay, I won't tell you my secret. <laughs> there's, a, there's several of these growing along the roadside. And if you go out there right now, you can pick yourself a bucket of Chinese chestnuts. They're not as good to eat as American, but they're good to eat. <clears throat> okay, remember what I said about the blight not killing the roots? All right, two very important situations fortunately came together. One is the roots don't die, so those roots still are sending up these little shoots. And they might live five, six, seven years, get three or four inches in diameter, but then the blight kills them. But occasionally, and there's another term you have to remember because it's going to come back too, Occasionally, one will survive. This one's in Waitsville, Vermont. And we call those mother trees. There's a good reason we call them mother trees, because we were looking for wild Americans that lived long enough to flower. We'll come back to that. So the other wonderful thing that happened was Dr. Charles Burnham, who was a plant geneticist from the University of Minnesota, spent his career doing genetic backcrossing to produce disease-resistant agricultural crops in the Plains states. He retired in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. He, for some reason, got curious about the American chestnut tree. And he was disturbed when he found out that nobody had taken the, back cr the genetic crossing any, any further than just crossing one wild America with one Chinese tree. That's as far as anybody went. So Dr. Burnham teamed up with one of his cohorts, Phil Rudder, and they formed 
the American Chestnut Foundation in 1983. And Dr. Burnham's whole mission was to use genetic backcrossing to try to save or recover the American chestnut tree. And here's how that works. Remember, we already had this, this cross had already happened back in the 1930s, 1940s. You just cross an American with a Chinese, you get an F1 generation. What Dr. Burnham did was then take that F1 and pollinate it with another wild American. So you had a back cross generation one. Then he took that tree and did it again. He got a back cross two. So when he got to back cross three, he started to intercross the BC threes together. And as you can see, every step of the way, it's getting a little more uh, American and a little less Chinese. So he did this, his, his plan was to do this for six generations. Now what he did, at every generation, he would plant these BC1s, he'd let them grow for five to eight years till they get up maybe three or four inches in diameter, and then he would intentionally inoculate them with the chestnut blight, the fungus. And most of those trees would die. He was looking for the few that showed the most resistance. He would use nuts from those trees to go on to the next generation. And that happened for every one of these six generations. So that's where we are right now, and we feel pretty good about it. We think we've got a tree that has a pretty good chance of surviving in our forest. Now, what we, this is what happens when you, we go in and intentionally inoculate a tree. We'll inoculate it, go back a year from then, the inoculation time, and this one's pretty well infected. But if, the, if, the, if, the, uh, if there's no blight showing or if it's just mild, those are the ones that we will probably save for the next generation. Most of this work, all this work has been done at our research facility in Meadowview, Virginia, the, the uh, Glenn Price Research Lab, where they've, over the years, have planted tens of thousands of these trees. And as I say, we would only keep those that showed the most resistance. And if you go down there today, that's what you'll see. Those few trees out there are the ones that are showing the most resistance. And it's only about 160, 165 acre little facility but that's where the work is done, and Dr. Fred Hebbard is the one who oversaw almost all of that work. He retired a couple of years ago. It's now being run by uh, Dr. Jared uh, Westbrook. So here's the situation. Meadowview has gone through this process, thinks they have a tree that can withstand the blight, but we're looking at a 200 million acre range and all we have is a little 160 acre farm. So how do you make that happen all over the range? You do it <clears throat> by creating chapters in each of the states. Excuse me. You create a chapter in each of the states and have them duplicate what was done at Meadowview with local trees. So we have our little Vermont, New Hampshire chapter. We've been doing this for 10 years. So we're, we're behind the, uh, uh, most of the chapters have been around longer than that. Maine and Massachusetts have been working on their projects for 20 years. We're only into our 10th or 11th year. But what we've done is duplicate the same process that Dr. Hebbard developed at Meadowview but we use local mother trees. Remember the term, you know what a mother tree is? It's a tree that lives, wild tree, that lives long enough to flower. And we, we, the process we've used was called controlled pollination. We find one of these trees, and here again, there's the little flowers. These are the catkins. We find one of those trees. First thing we do is go, and just before the flowers open, cut the catkins away because we don't want them to get pollinated with anything else at this time. So then we take and put them in these little bags so they won't get pollinated. 
let the flowers open, go back in about a week, and, and, and hand pollinate them. We bag them, pollinate them, and then we go back yeah, about this time of year, maybe another week or two, and harvest the nuts. Now, the pollen that we used came from the third generation trees from Meadowview. So these are going to be fourth generation nuts that we then put in orchards. This is the tree that we found in Hudson. I gave this talk in 2010 to the women's club. This lady came up to me afterwards with a paper bag. Oh, we got one of those trees right here in Hudson. Well, sure enough, it was. A 65 foot tall, 14 inch diameter wild American chestnut. This was in March. We had to pollinate it by June. So we, we talked to the landowner. He let us go in there. The, what used to be Public Service of New Hampshire, now it's Eversource, they provide the bucket trucks to, for us to do this. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we did, we went in, we pollinated that tree, and we got 194 viable nuts off it. Now, what each chapter was, had to do was develop 20 different lines. In other words, our chapter had to find 20 different trees each tree is a line, and, at, and we had to get at least 100 nuts off of each of those trees. So this was one of our lines, and then we went back, this was in 2010, went back in 2011, getting all ready to do it again, and the blight had killed that tree in one year. That's why there's a piece of it with us tonight. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the landowner was very cooperative. He let us take the tree, Took this old sawmill over in Pelham, and uh, Paul, Stett, Paul Steck uh, sawed it up for us. And uh, we have the lumber now, and we've been using it for different projects to raise funds. Um, one thing, a, a woodworker up in Weyer, New Hampshire, Dave Kucher, made this table for us out of that tree. And then we used that to raise some money. He even hand inlaid a chestnut leaf right in the top of the table. Beautiful piece of work. And of course, I made the, well, let's say I made the mistake. I, and I went to a, did a couple of these talks and I said, are there any woodworkers out there who would like to work with some chestnut wood? I mean, and no pun intended, but woodworkers just Came out of the almost <laughs> ran me over. I mean, they just, <laughs> if they could get their hands on chestnut, they will, they will do it. But then Dave, fortunately, was the, uh, he got to do that job for us. So anyway, back to the, the Hudson tree. Uh, those nuts were planted up in Perkinsville, Vermont in 2011. I apologize, I haven't been up for four years. I know how they, they were doing pretty well the third year. They grow very fast. They can, uh, they can grow four feet in a year when they're saplings. They really, really take off if they're taken care of. What we have in this area for orchards, this is our, oldest, our chapter's oldest orchard. It's out in Peterborough at the Sheeling State Forest. As you're coming into Peterborough, old road at the blinking light, take a right. It's down there toward the, the uh, hospital. Uh, the first trees were planted there in 2008, 10 years ago. And uh, they're, they're doing pretty well. Now, we went in and inoculated those trees this July. Remember this process, once they get established, we bore a little hole in them and put the chestnut blight right in there, and we'll go back next year and watch them. And uh, almost, we might keep 20 out of 300 trees. All the others, we just, because those are the ones we need. They're the ones that are showing the most blight resistant. So that's, uh, that's the way it's done. Uh, this is an orchard of 350 trees we put into uh, Beaver Brook in Hollis. Uh, this is the only orchard like this that we have in New England. It's called the Progeny Test Orchard, where we've planted wild Americans, wild Asian, all the different generations, uh, just to see how they will do in, in this environment. And uh, we don't take care of these trees. They don't get the the weeding and the watering that our chestnuts do because we wanted to try to survive on their own. 
And if you go out there today, you'll see that some of them are doing very well, others have died. It's a real mixed bag, but we're keeping records <clears throat> on all these, all these different trees. This is where we have found mother trees in Vermont and New Hampshire, the green symbols. And the little red symbols are where we have orchards. Uh, the reason there's so much activity up in Burlington, Vermont, is that's where uh, we have one paid employee for all the New England chapters. Her name's Kendra Collin, and she is stationed up in Burlington, Vermont, <coughs> with the U.S. Forest Service. So everybody else, everything else is done by volunteers. Another thing we've been doing is putting in what we call educational plantings, where we'll plant four to six of the, the uh, sixth generation trees and it, we, we put them in a, a publicly exposed place and put up a sign so we can tell our story. I'm sure everybody here has heard of Benson's Wild Animal Farm. This is over at Benson Park in Hudson. We put this, uh, we, we have eight trees growing over there. They were planted in 2011 and uh, one of them, a couple of them are doing very, very well. So, But we put one in at the Enamorist in April and another one out at Ringe this past April. So that's more of an educational tool that so we can uh, uh, just get more people aware of our whole effort. Uh, oh, we did another one. <coughs> now, and you're history people, so you all certainly know about historic Monson Center. <coughs> Few heads going. This is one of the most hidden jewels around here. So many people have no idea what, what or where Monson Center is. Do you know where Federal Hill is in Milford? If you go up to the top of Federal Hill, you're actually, there's, there's part of um, Hollis and Milford, a little piece of, of uh, Amherst. In the 1700s, 1732, I think, uh, some people tried to start a community there and it lasted not quite 40 years. They couldn't make it. And now it's a 160-acre parcel managed by the Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests. And it's, uh, there's a descendant named Russ Dickerman, uh, a descendant of one of the families who's out there almost every day. This little, little house left at the end of the entrance road, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous spot and all kinds of history where, where the old, some of the old foundations are, there'll be a sign, this is where Farmer Jones lived or the doctor or whatever. But it never ceases to amaze me how few people even know it's there. Of course, if you're gonna try to go, have somebody tell you how to get there because <laughs> you, you, you'll drive right by it and never even know it. There's no sign, but it's a, it's a real jewel of a spot. So anyway, we planted, we have six the B3, F3, six generation trees growing out there. This, if you want to get involved, this information is in your handouts. Um, if you want to, we'd love to have you become a member and follow along on how the project's going. If you do, uh, you'll get our journal periodically. There's some over there on the table. You'll see what they're like. And my wife Carol is here. She uh, knows as much about as this as I do. And she's been going around with a sign-up sheet. If you want to get on our email list, we'll send you periodic emails of how things are progressing. And these are our key people right now. This is Kendra. That's Kendra right there. She, Kendra Collins, she's, I say, the only paid employee. She works all, all the New England chapters. Just last Saturday, she organized a regional meeting over in Portsmouth uh, of all the the main mass, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire chapters. It's an annual thing she does. Great meeting. We all get together and see how we're all doing and learn from each other. So, uh, and then our president is Yuri Bayoun. And if anybody wants, you know, anybody wants to hear this talk, uh, let me know. My information is in the handouts there. And if you want to sneak in the back door and not become a member, if you go to the Chestnut Foundation webpage, acf.org, you'll see this little icon called the eSprouts. And you just click on that, and that'll bring you up to date on what's going on 
nationally, uh, not so much in, the, in our, just in our chapter, but, but uh, the best thing to do though is come on, sign up, become a member, we can use your help. It's because we're all very much a volunteer-driven organization. So, Carol, did I forget anything? What did I forget? They, they, they found a tree. Yes. Okay. Um, we have already gotten all the 20 lines we need, so we're not out <clears throat> actively seeking mother trees. But if you are aware of <clears throat> a, wild, a wild American chestnut tree that has lived long enough and is flowering, we're very interested in knowing about that tree because we're trying to collect the DNA from as many uh, wild American trees as we can. And uh, it's been a while since we found one in, in this area, but uh, if you do know of one, uh, and uh, another thing I forgot to mention was, up here I've got some leaf samples, so if you, if you think you found a chestnut tree, uh, go, go to our webpage, uh, acf.org and there's actually a little box and it'll say do you think you found a chestnut tree and then you can download what's called a locator form we have one. yeah we've got one right here if you want to and you just fill out the information on where the tree is and who you are and who the landowner is and you send a leaf sample and a twig up to Kendra and she'll confirm if it is or is not a wild American because yeah, we're trying to save the DNA from those trees while they're still they're still surviving. So, so that's the story of the American chestnut restoration. And somebody must have some questions. Ooh. Okay. Uh, my question has to do with the, the Hudson tree. Since the first year, since the year it was found by you guys, and you took nuts. And you thought it was going to be a mother tree, but the next year it had the blight. Did you just, what did you do? Did you destroy the, the nuts that you had gotten because they weren't, they weren't resistant? No, no, those are the nuts that are growing in the orchard up in Perkinsville, Vermont. But the tree, the tree, yeah, the tree was dead. So the landowner let us take the tree for the wood. Right, but doesn't that invalidate that being a blight resistant tree? Well, it, was, it's, it wasn't a blight resistant tree. For That's some, what I'm saying. For some, it for some reason, it survived for 40 years. But there's a, there's a, tr there's a wild chestnut tree in um, Lovell, Maine. It's 115 feet tall. It's the largest one known anywhere in the world. And the blight hasn't gotten to it yet. But it'll be, maybe it won't, I don't know. But I, I don't know if I've answered your question yet. Maybe I'm not asking you. What I'm saying is, okay, you found the tree, it didn't have light, you took nuts. Then right. you used those nuts to start a line. Right. But the next year the tree had light. Yeah. Doesn't that invalidate it being a light? Oh, no, tree? no, not at all. No, okay. no, no. Because uh, I think it's fair to say that every tree that we've taken a line from is now dead. I mean, and most of them, they, they get six or eight inches in diameter. They don't get very big. It's a degree of resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What does the blight survive on? So that it's always around and cause trouble. It'll, it survives on oaks, for one thing. So it's, it's, every, it's everywhere. We all, this is about the time of year it starts to disperse its, um, its spores. Yeah. And every one of us have inhaled those things. You can't help it. It's just everywhere. There's no, there's no stopping it. So, uh, yeah, it, and, and it probably survives on other things, but it survives on oaks, but it doesn't affect them at all. But it'll, it'll regenerate. Let's assume for a second that you are successful in destroying the American chestnut to its original uh, population. Which tree will suffer as a result? I give up. Which tree? <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's a good question. It'll certainly alter the forest as we know them now. Uh, but forests are getting, you know, the only constant in nature is change. Anyway, things are always, we're, we're about to lose all our ash trees due to the emerald ash borer. 
you know, what's going to take their place? You know, that's, that's a good question, but I don't think anybody really knows. So, uh, one thing I, I should mention is that this process that, that our chapter has gone through uh, is the same process that all the other chapters except New York has gone through. New York has developed a laboratory GMO. They went looking for something out in the natural world that they could uh, combine into a the chestnut tree that would resist the blight. The 30th thing they looked at was, for some reason, a gene in wheat. And they are pretty convinced that that, germ, that that gene in wheat will resist chestnut blight. So they're now going through the formal process of getting a GMO approved. And it's... Uh, through the FDA. Hmm? Through the FDA. Yeah, the FDA, EPA, Agriculture Department. It, it, this, is a, this is a very complicated process. Anyone has to go through to, for a, to get one of these things approved. But there's a lot of discussion going on about that right now. Uh, just so many people are just so opposed to anything GMO that it's, uh, it's just, you know, it could be getting out of control. And we don't know what the unintended consequences might be. So you know, that right now, there's just a lot of discussion going on because for 20 plus years, the New York chapter has been working with State University of New York in Syracuse, their, their lab to do this, and nobody, you know, other than the New York people, the other chapters were just cruising along doing what we've been doing. Well, they might be there. So now everybody's perking up and say, well, wait a minute, do we really want to do this? Do we want to release this artificial thing out into the world? So I don't know, stay tuned. Yeah, become members and you can follow that story along. So, so. Sir? I have, I have a chestnut in my backyard. Um, it, it, it grows up out of a stump yep. and it grows, I don't know, maybe an inch or two in diameter, yep. and then it gets that pink yep. ring around it, and then it, it dies back down. So it, is that is that something you care about? I mean, it doesn't doesn't create nuts. No, it that's uh, that gets far enough along. You can find that situation all, all over the place. The place. Okay. Yeah. So you're not well, interested in those. Afraid not. Okay. If it if you find one that lives long enough to flower, now uh, here's another interesting thing about chestnuts. They are monoecious, which means you need two trees for them to pollinate. Each tree produces both male and female parts, but one tree will not pollinate itself. So if you do find a tree that's producing viable nuts, that means there's another one not too far away. Uh, there's a little box, if you're really interested, there's a little box over there on the table. I can't go over there because the cameraman said I had to stay here. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> but. Uh, when, when those burrs open, yes, uh, if, the, if there are two trees and the nuts get pollinated, there'll be a plump little nut inside that burr. Otherwise, the burr will open and there's just this shriveled up little thing about the size of a pea in there. That means there was not another tree close enough to pollinate it. So, so if you do come across a chestnut tree and there are burrs, and you see a shiny little nut in there, we want to know about it. So you mentioned the, uh, the different traits that uh, the American chestnut has. Uh, do the, uh, the horse chestnut or the Asian one, they have the same traits as far as uh, durability? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, the, well again, there are some leaf samples over there. You can see the difference in the leaf, the, the little rule of thumb we use. If it looks like a canoe, it's an American chestnut. If it looks like a rowboat, it's a Chinese chestnut. The Chinese tree, though, um, like, I, like I pointed out, it doesn't grow tall. It's very bushy. It won't survive in our forests. Um, Most of the time you see them in yards. Yeah, they'll be in a landscape so situation. B3F3, will that have any of the American traits? Or? 
but enough well, of the what, American right, what, to... what, what, we're, what we've tried to do is, is uh, breed out all the Chinese characteristics except those few genes that resist the blight. That's what, we've, that's what we're trying to do. There's uh, 40,000 genes in a chestnut tree and three or four of them show the, the ability to resist the blight. Those are the ones we're trying to get into the wild American. So, you know, in a sense, that's a, we're playing around with uh, nature too, but, uh, yeah, and you know. If, in Nashua, you could mention that over the last few years, we found two or three of them at Hollis Crossing. And we yeah. were able to get nuts because they were yes. cross-pollinating. Yep. And then, of course, we need to follow up on that. And we've gone back within the last three years, and the trees that we were working with are all dead. So it's, you're just lucky if you yeah. find them when they're still healthy. And the same thing happened in Milford, New Hampshire. We found a development on Federal Hill. I forget the name of it. Again, oh, reserve. a brand reserve. new, beautiful neighborhood. There were three or four uh, chestnut trees. They were blooming, they were producing nuts. I went back with Kurt last year, they were dead. So like, yeah. we get real excited when people find the trees and they're flowering, because we know if we don't get those nuts right away, the potential is they're probably gonna die. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, here's a cute little chestnut story. The same woman who found this tree in Hudson called me about four years ago and said, and she said my daughter has a chestnut tree growing in her yard and it's doing great. And this was again, also was in Hudson. So we went up and found the tree, and sure enough, I mean, it, it looked so American. It had, it, we just thought we had nailed another good one. Sent the leaf up to Kendra, and she looks at us, oh, that's a European chestnut. If you buy chestnuts in a grocery store around Thanksgiving, those are from the European chestnut tree, sativa. So, that's weird because the, the, we know there are some um, European trees growing in California in some orchards, but we didn't know of any around here. So we weren't able to find the, land, the a landowner when we first went up there, but we did track him down. And he says, oh yeah, about six or seven years ago at Thanksgiving, I just went to Hannaford's and got some of those nuts and threw them out in my yard. <laughs> So, but then we went, we went back again, and that tree's dead, too. Is there something going on that is, right now, in the last few years, attacking these otherwise mature trees? That's doing what? Well, well you, you keep saying, and she said, we found this wonderful tree, it's growing just fine, we took the nuts, yeah. and next year it's dead. And this sounds like a pattern. Is, is there a well, but it's been going on for decades. I mean, every once in a while, there'll be a tree that has a little bit of ability to hang on, but eventually, everyone we found so far, the blade gets it. But this is nothing new. This has been going on since. Well, it's kind of surprising to find anything that has still survived to, to get enough. Well, you can, uh, you can find, there are areas where there are lots and lots of wild chestnut trees growing, but again, it's like you described, they're little, a federal hill, the whole north side of Federal Hill. You can go in the woods anywhere out there and find well, chestnut well, trees. And Concord too, if they walk the trails up there. Oh yeah, the Audubon Center in Concord. If you ever go up there and walk the trails, there's lots of chestnut trees around there. So all right, well Carol and I will be around and glad to answer your questions and come on up and see uh, what we've got here and oh another thing, when you come up pick up that cookie and see how light it is. That's another wonderful feature of that wood. But it is, I just put a little bit of oil on it, yeah. Very smooth. Yeah, yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Kurt.